Oh, Jesus. Have you ever had a spidey moment where you caught something without even thinking? You surprise yourself even? What is happening to let us react so quickly? Why do we sometimes not even see the thing that we're reacting to? And only after we like did. We're going to see how to improve our reaction times and how this differs from a reflex. This is good for athletes or gamers who need to respond to fast-paced dynamics. It's also very relevant to anyone who wishes to improve their reaction times for everyday life, such as driving or for catching that egg that's about to roll up your counter. There's a lot in this topic, so we're gonna split this up into two videos. This is part one, where I give you the science and foundational pieces to understand reflexes and reactions and how they differ from each other. In part two, we'll take a look at some studies that have uncovered a very interesting fact about our reaction times. You'll also learn how to leverage this knowledge to improve your own reaction times. People talk about having a fast reaction time. Is this the same thing as a reflex though? No, they're different. Reflexes happen much faster. A reflex is touching a scorching hot pan and reflexively pulling the hand back. Ouch. Now, what's so special about this? Well, this movement is crazy fast. It takes about 15 to 30 milliseconds for you to pull your hand away. That's way faster than it takes for you to blink. A blink can take anywhere between 100 to 400 milliseconds. So your reflexive movement is so fast that it doesn't even wait for your brain to receive the pain signal. So here's how it works. When you touch that scorching hot pan, the temperature in your fingers skyrockets. It passes a certain pain threshold that then signals a pain response. So the nerves in your fingers send a distress signal up through your arm and into your spine. And because this is such a high distress signal, your spine immediately sends a signal back out into your arm, telling the muscles in your arm to contract, to pull your hand away from that hot pan. It was an automatic response due to the level of intensity of that pain. That signal also continues to travel from your spine up into your brain so that your brain can process what just happened. But by the time that signal reaches your brain and your brain's had time to process the information, your hand is already well away from that terribly hot pan. Reflexes happen so quickly because they bypass the brain entirely. If the brain was involved in a decision, it would take a lot longer. That's because the brain is computing so much information that it just takes time to register what's happening. So thankfully, your body already has automatic response mechanisms that are installed that don't rely on your brain. Now, what about a survival situation that requires using the brain? How does the body react fast enough if the brain is involved? Well, your brain has found ways to bypass the slower parts of itself. Let's see an example. Let's say you're walking across a busy road and then you realize that there's a bus headed straight for you. Somehow the driver hasn't seen you and you've got to react quickly. In this case, you have to see or hear the bus to know it's coming right at you. These senses are processed by your brain. So there's no way around your brain in this case. Let's say there's lots of traffic noise. So it's really just your eyes that are detecting the bus's approach. Let's take a closer look at how sight works. This will help us see just how long it takes for our brain to process visual information. It also sets us up well for understanding the clever ways that our brain has found to bypass some of this processing time to give you a better chance of survival. Sight is an incredibly complex sense. How does our brain process images? Well, most of the processing happens way back here in the occipital lobe. Our eyes send visual information all the way back to this region. This is what the occipital lobe looks like. It sits in the very back of your brain. To break down the occipital lobe further, let's take a look at a classic drawing of the brain. This drawing was published by Corbinian Brodmann in 1909. Brodmann is best known for mapping the outer layers of the human brain. This region here is the entire occipital lobe, but you can break it down into different layers. Layers of the occipital lobe perform different functions. The visual signal initially enters the very back portion of the occipital lobe, called the striate cortex, 
or V1, denoting the first visual processing center. So V1 is primarily involved in figuring out the basic components of a scene. So there are certain neurons in V1 that are more sensitive to the size and length of an object. Other neurons found in V1 are more sensitive to the direction in which an object moves. So these are very rudimentary observations at this point. There's no color, there's no clear distinctive shapes. But from there, the signal travels out to the next layer of the occipital lobe, and then the next layer. Each section builds out the image with more clarity, color, and detail. So that's just a quick overview of the occipital lobe. Really, all that you have to know is that it takes a lot of processing power, and it takes time to generate a full image of what you're seeing. So in our bus situation, you're walking across the road, and your eyes detect movement in your peripheral vision. Your eyes glance over, and immediately you find yourself jumping out of the way before you've even registered what you just saw. How does that work? How did your body get you to move so quickly that you didn't even have time to see that it was a bus headed towards you? All you knew is that something was moving in your direction. You had to get out of the way fast. So what's happening there? Is the body finding a way to bypass parts of the brain? To answer this, let's see what happened when your eyes glanced over at the bus. Light from the bus entered your eyes and stimulated a layer of light-sensitive cells sitting in the back of your eye. These cells are called photoreceptors. Now these cells send a signal, an electric signal. This is how our brain transmits information. It's electrical. So from the eye, this signal travels through the optic nerve to our brain. Now from there, the signal travels all the way back to the occipital lobe. So you can process the visual information, right? I and mean, that's what we just talked about. But the signal takes a rather interesting path to get there. Here's a top-down view. You'll see that the left side of your right eye travels to the left side of your brain, and that the right side of your right eye travels to the right side of your brain. And the same thing happens in your other eye. Now this is pretty wild, right? But this isn't the crazy part that I want to tell you about. Look closer at the path there's something in the middle of your brain that the signal has to travel through before it reaches the occipital lobe. This thing we're seeing is called the thalamus. The thalamus is super important. It's basically the gatekeeper for sensory information. It's the relay station for this information to travel through, for sight, sound, touch, taste, but not smell. All senses aside from smell travel through the thalamus. Now the thalamus is key to helping us dodge that bus so quickly. It's found a way to instigate a fight or flight response before our occipital lobe has even had time to process the visual information. How? The thalamus seems like it can actually interpret some of the visual information coming from your eyes. Now not to the same granularity and detail that the occipital lobe can do, but it seems like it can gather enough information to know whether you need to start running because there's something headed straight for you. And it can do this a lot faster than what the occipital lobe can do. So if the thalamus registers that there's a threat to your body, it sends a distress signal to parts of your brain and body to spike your adrenaline and to prepare you for running. It initiates a fight or flight response before your occipital lobe has even had time to process this information. This is how you can bypass parts of your brain, the slower parts, in more of a survival situation. So this fight or flight response completely takes over your body before your rational mind even knows what's happening. And before you know it, your body is running on its own accord before you've even figured out what just happened. Yeah, your body left your rational mind in the dust. Now your rational mind will eventually receive that information. While that fight or flight response was being triggered, your thalamus was sending the information back to your occipital lobe, but also up to these outer, more rational parts of your brain. These outer layers are called the cortex. Cortex literally means bark. So these outer cortical layers take time to process information. They're considered to be the newer parts of our brain, the more recently evolved parts. And they directly contribute to our ability to make calculated decisions or problem solve or plan or even abstract thought. Now these outer layers are usually more accurate 
and better at figuring out what's happening in our environment compared to the thalamus. But they take time. You know when you get spooked? Like you hear a loud noise and you jump. And then a moment or two later, you realize that it was just a door slamming closed. Well, that amount of time that it took for you to realize it was just a door is how long it takes for your rational mind to catch up to your body, for the outer cortical layers of your brain to receive and process that information. If you weren't in a survival situation, your brain would likely wait for these outer regions to process your surroundings before making a movement. This gives you more time to plan a well-coordinated movement, which can help reduce the chance of injury. So how long does it take for you to react when you're using your cortical regions in a non-survival situation? Well, for a visual cue, your reaction time will be about 200 milliseconds. That's for you to process what's happening and to start your movement, not actually to complete it, just to start that movement. For an auditory response, it's a little faster. It takes about 140 to 160 milliseconds. But when you're startled by a noise and the fight or flight response kicks in, you can initiate your movement in as little as 40 to 100 milliseconds. The fight or flight response depends on more of the deeper brain structures that respond automatically to stimulus. They're considered to be older brain structures, older on an evolutionary time scale. Now these ancient structures evolved millions of years ago and successfully helped our ancestors evade predators and other catastrophes. So these structures react quickly. So your body has, in a way, found a solution to maintain that reflexive response that fast, almost instantaneous response. But instead of bypassing the brain entirely, your body has chosen to bypass just parts of the brain, the parts that take a long time to process information. Now those parts are still receiving information, but in this situation, your body is not waiting around for those parts to give commands. So to recap, we learned that your reflexes can respond crazy fast to stimuli, such as touching a hot pan. It can take about 15 to 30 milliseconds for this to happen. This is so fast because it completely bypasses your brain. Now, when your brain is required for processing your environment and responding to a threat, the time it takes for you to respond will increase because your brain is involved. But your brain has found ways to save you precious time by bypassing the slower, more computationally heavy parts of your brain, like your cortex, but is there a way to make your normal reaction time as fast as your fight or flight response time without you having to get startled all the time? Some research papers are indicating that it is possible. That's what we'll be exploring in part two. So you should now know why reflexes are so fast. You should also understand how your brain can save you precious time in a survival situation. With this knowledge, we're going to see how we can hack this survival pathway to help you improve your reaction times by up to 35%. So if you're curious to see how to do this, or if you wanna see how some athletes are training this, check out part two, where we'll explore this in depth. Once part two is up, it'll be linked here. If you wanna support these videos, one of the best no cost ways to do that is by subscribing to the channel. Just hit that subscribe button, it would really help us. Also, if you know anyone who's interested in this material, please send this video along to them. Okay, I'll see you in part two.